Good day YouTubers and welcome to the third episode in the series on Northern Moreton Bay. I hadn't intended to put this video out quite so soon. My plan was to be out on the bay overnighting and catching plenty of fish instead of sitting here doing a video. I had my leave all booked but something came up at work that really needed to be done so I cancelled my leave to do that. And here I am sitting here doing a video instead of being out on the bay enjoying myself. So that might mean that I make two trips out before I do the next video, but we'll see how that goes. I do want to get out on the bay, it's been like four weeks I think since I've been out and I'm getting withdrawal symptoms, plus I've got some things that I want to try. But anyway, that's my problem. You're here to see this video, so let's get cracking on that. I'm going to backtrack back to Shark Spit for a minute. I just wanted to talk about these shipwrecks. I've decided that I'd like to include the shipwrecks in Moreton Bay in this series, or at least the ones in the northern part of Moreton Bay. I might come and do another series on the ones further south. There's over a hundred shipwrecks in Moreton Bay that we know about, but unfortunately we only have an exact location on about 26 of those. We know the rest went down somewhere, and we have an approximate location for where they are, but if anyone's found them, they're not saying. But we'll just start off here by having a look at a couple that are pretty obvious to anyone who drives past, and that's the two on the beach at Shark Spit. The southernmost of the two wrecks is the Norman B, and that was just run aground and abandoned in 1927. Not quite sure why they'd do that, I would have thought that sending it to the breakers would have at least got some money back for them, but in any event that's how it ended its life. It was quite a small ship of just under a hundred tons and there's not a lot left of it after sitting on the beach for nearly a century. Back in its day, its job was to collect molasses from the mills down along the Logan, Albert, Narang and Coomera rivers and discharge that up at Strath Pine where it was turned into rum. A fairly sad ending for any ship just to be left on the beach to rot away. Just to the north of the Norman Beat is the Fairlight, and that poor ship suffered much the same fate. It was just run aground and abandoned in the 1930s. Again, nearly a century on, there's not a lot left of it. The Fairlight was a double-ended twin-wheel paddle steamer, and it was reported to be very luxurious in its day. It came out to Australia in 1878 and started life as a passenger ferry. So we're talking about a really old ship here, it had quite an eventful life, involved in a number of incidents on the water, and at least one death. It was eventually converted into a cargo vessel and was put to work transporting coal from about 1914. As far as I can tell from the records, it continued in that role until it was eventually beached and left to rot. Captain Nielsen's a fairly popular fishing ground now. It used to be one of these secret spots that people in the know went to to catch huge fish, but I think just about everyone and his dog knows about fishing the Captain Nielsen now. Still produces fish, but apparently not in the sort of quality and numbers that they used to be. The Captain Nielsen was a steam-powered suction hopper dredge of 1,599 gross tonnes that capsized in Mort Bay on September 18, 1964. There were 24 crew on board and nine of them lost their lives. 16 men were trapped inside the hull and rescue operations managed to save 11 of them. And in those days that was a record for the number of people rescued from inside a capsized hull. The incident itself made world news and certainly filled up the TV screens here in Brisbane for a while. September 18, 1964 was a Friday and I was in grade four at the time and the only news I was really interested in was what happened in the schoolyard. However, I don't think I'll ever forget these images in the paper and on the TV. Got quite a lot of coverage, it was a big event at the time and it happened on the water in Moreton Bay basically our backyard. So that certainly attracted my interest. The fact that it was a boat and I was interested in boats also got my interest. So even though I was very young, I looked at everything there was at the time. The only other things I ever remember being so interested in was aeroplanes and spaceflight. Ships or boats, aeroplanes and spaceflight, they always got my attention on the news. 
nothing else really mattered. Even back then, I just marveled at the heroism of the guys that went into that upturned ship to rescue the people. It must have been pitch black in there. I guess they had torches, but to go into that ship when they didn't know how long it was going to stay afloat was pretty brave. So hats off to them. As I say, even at that young age, the axe impressed me. And the images of the survivors was just unforgettable. Eventually the boat was raised and repaired and it returned to Holland. However, bits of it were left on the bottom. The wheelhouse in particular was the biggest part left on the bottom, but there's other deck structures there as well. And that's what we call the Captain Nielsen wreck. It's not the entire boat, just bits of it. And it still produces some fish. Sharks seem to hang out there a bit, but it's not a bad fishing spot just the same if you can find yourself a spot amongst the boats that are there these days. The secret is to get there early and camp it. The site itself is surrounded by sandy ridges and it's in about 12, 13 metres of water. A little bit to the west of the wheelhouse is some concrete blocks, which I understand are leftovers from a beacon that was there. And over to the east of that is a drop off. Having a poke around just away from the wreck a little bit can sometimes yield some very nice results. There's a number of marks here for the Captain Nielsen wreck. Depending on where you look, you get a different mark. One of them is mine and it is over the wreck, or at least where my GPS said it was over the wreck. But I've left all the marks in because what happens is you get there and there's a lot of boats there, so you sound around a little bit to find a spot that's not too close to someone else. So long as I'm somewhere within the radius of all these marks, I'm happy to fish it. Otherwise, I'll move on and find somewhere else that's not quite as popular. It's only just recently that I've started taking screenshots of what I see on the bottom and attaching them to GPS marks that I keep in the program that I use to organise these things. And while I fished the Captain Nielsen quite a bit, I don't have any screenshots from the sounder. If I did take any, they've been lost over time because, as I said, it's only recently I've started attaching them to the marks and keeping them organised. But never fear, if you get there and you have a sound around, you will recognise it when you see it. If you're not seeing the structure on the bottom, you're not at the Captain Nielsen. I've seen fish right beside it, some really good big shows, and I've seen fish in the vicinity. So don't be frightened to sound around and just see where the fish are before you anchor up and try to get some on your boat. Pretty much south of the Captain Nielsen wreck is another wreck, and that is the Wanderer. But I wasn't around to see the coverage of this wreck because it went down in 1848, a little bit before my time. The Wanderer was a two-masted schooner of 131 tonnes and was carrying a cargo from Launceston when it sank in Moreton Bay. There were eight crew on board and two passengers on its final voyage. When it went down, there was only one survivor. According to the article, he was found clinging to the mast, so it went down in shallow enough water that the mast was still above water when it came to rest, and this fellow was rescued the next day from the mast. The ship went down just one week from now when I'm recording this, and 173 years ago, and that was on the 9th of July, 1848. The ship itself was just over 23 metres long with a beam of 5.5 metres or a little bit more. But despite its size, the wreckage has never been found. The material it was constructed of is not recorded, but given the date, I think wood is a fairly fair bet. So I guess most of it's rotted away by now. But on the other hand, the Mary Rose sank in 1545, I think it was and it was still surprisingly intact when they raised it in 1982. So wood can survive for quite a long time, depending on what sort of wood it is. The vessel itself's never been located, and its position is based on historical reports of the sinking. It's unlikely that there's much there to find, but it's somewhere in that area. One interesting thing about it is that the owner's name was James Cook, now don't get excited, it's not the James Cook that we're all familiar with, but it's a fascinating coincidence just the same. The wreck itself was reported in the Moreton Bay Courier 
on the 22nd of July 1848 and also in the Sydney Chronicle on the 15th of July 1848, just in case you're interested in looking up the original reports. Next I'm going to talk about a small wreck in the bay. It's been known as the Ammo Barge and it's generally marked on any maps I've ever seen as the Ammo Barge, where it is marked at all. Most fishermen know it as that. I suppose wreck's a bit of a generous term for it because the site's only about 20 metres square and the biggest remaining part is the engine and boiler from the ship. Divers have reported that there is actually ammunition down there and there are a few rotted planks left from the ship itself. Divers have also taken a lot of artefacts away from the ship as souveniring. I guess that doesn't matter so much for the fishing, as long as the major items stay there to provide some structure. Divers also report that stonefish are quite abundant in the area, so don't be surprised if you pull one of them up. Although I've never caught one there myself, and I don't actually know of anyone who has caught them. I have read that Ed Slaughter from the Queensland Museum did a lot of research into the ammo barge, and in 2008, he was pretty confident that the ammo barge was actually the SS Dover. So far, I've been unable to find any information on the SS Dover or when it sank. Obviously, the likes of the Queensland Museum would have that information, but it's not available online that I've been able to find. As for fishing at the ammo barge, it is a very small area to fish. And it's also a very small area to find on your sounder, so you might have to circle around a bit before you actually find it. Once you've found it, you want to anchor up so that your bait comes down fairly close to it, because in my experience, while there are fish a little bit further away from it, my experience has been that the best fish are reasonably close to the wreck itself. I think I can safely say that whenever I've gone there and I've actually seen fish on the sounder around the wreck, that I've been able to pull something up. But it is one of those places in the bay where you need fairly precise positioning to get your bait where it needs to be. Now personally I don't mind pulling anything up if it gives me a decent fight on the way up. Even if it's no good I can throw it back and I've enjoyed the fight. But a lot of people complain about catching what they call vermin. And if you're too far away from the wreck that's about what you will catch here. There is quite a bit of vermin fish hanging around. But if you don't mind a good fight then it's not really a problem. I'm just going to circle back to Lucinda Bay here. That's a decent anchorage on Morton Island. I skipped past it in the last episode. I went from Shark Spit up to Tangaluma and forgot all about it. So I'll just go back for a minute and talk about that. Lucinda Bay is a decent anchorage for any wind that's predominantly from the east. Depending on the weather, I would probably prefer to anchor somewhere where I've marked that yellow line. The reasons for that being that along that yellow line I'm protected from winds from say the north-northeast down around to the southeast. You get much more northerly or southerly than that and you'll get some swells coming around the corners. Shark Spit to the south protects you a little bit and Tangalima Point to the north again protects you a little bit. The other reason why I'd anchor around that yellow line is the sandbar that's just off to the west of that area and that helps protect you from any swell that happens to come in from the west. Lucinda Bay has a nice sandy beach. You can get off there really easy at high tide. Low tide gets a little bit shallow in places, just depends where you get off. It tends not to be as popular as Tangaluma further north or the sand hills further south. I like it for that reason because when I'm out on the water I don't like crowded anchorages and this one suits me pretty well. You'll find dolphins anywhere around Morton Bay, particularly along Morton Island. There seem to be more dolphins up around that end of the bay than anywhere else. They often hang around in Lucinda Bay. Now that could be because it's close to Tangalima and Tangalima Resort feeds the dolphins. That's one of their things. Nevertheless, there's often a lot of dolphins going through Lucinda Bay and they're always nice to watch. And just moving into the historical aspects of the bay, I've been told by a few people that Lucinda Bay was named after the government yacht Lucinda because apparently the yacht spent a fair amount of time taking the government members over to Lucinda Bay to fish and generally party. I don't know whether that's true or not. 
I haven't been able to find any authoritative references to that particular subject. I have seen references to it online and I remember reading at least one book that mentioned it, but all they amount to is hearsay because there was nothing official about them. Could just be one of those rumours that get around. Because after all, you wouldn't expect a politician to be over partying and relaxing on a government yacht when he should be back at home looking after the needs of his constituents. And that's not as facetious as it sounds, actually, because back in those days, a politician that was caught doing something or taking something that was not appropriate used to have the good grace to resign, rather than these days when they just tell us it's part of their entitlements. The other story I've heard about Lucinda Bay and the government yacht Lucinda is that the Queensland Constitution was drafted on the yacht while it was anchored up in Lucinda Bay. I've heard that story from a couple of people, but I think they're wrong. I think what they're confusing it with is that the government yacht was taken down to the Hawkesbury River by Sir Samuel Griffiths, and he hosted the Australian Constitutional Convention, and a lot of the Australian Constitution was drafted on the Lucinda while it was on the Hawkesbury River. I think they're confusing the two events because I can find nothing to support the idea that the Lucinda was involved in the drafting of the Queensland Constitution. And just a little bit more about the Queensland Government yacht Lucinda. Queensland separated from New South Wales in 1859 and in 1885, just 26 years later, the Queensland Government decided to purchase the Lucinda from Scotland for I think it was £13,000 of Queensland taxpayers' money. The Lucinda was 301 tonnes and 55 metres long. It served as a private yacht for the government members, took them up and down the Queensland coast, but it also did other things. It was a mail ship, it serviced the lighthouses along the Queensland coast, so it wasn't exclusively for the use of members of parliament. However, from what I've read, they did make good use of it. In 1891, it served as a base where politicians drafted the Australian Constitution. That was one of the high points in its career. It had a pretty fascinating career, really, but unfortunately it came to an end on the 28th of January 1937, where the vessel was eventually beached on the southeast side of Bishop Island at the mouth of the Brisbane River to form a breakwater. Since then, it's been covered up by the expansion of the Port of Brisbane although there wasn't much left of it by the time that happened. Well, wow, I digressed a lot from talking about Lucinda Bay there. But suffice it to say, Lucinda Bay is a nice place to visit. If you're up around Morton Island, you're looking for a nice area to stop and have lunch or just relax on the boat, and the wind's mainly from the east, pull in there and just have a look at it. Just watch that sandbank that's out from the island a little bit. You need to come in from the south or hug the island in from the north. Well, I'll wrap the episode up at this point. I'm sorry I managed to get carried away again on side issues. I hope you enjoyed them. I find these little bits of history fascinating, most particularly the drama of the Captain Nielsen because I saw that firsthand and it left a lasting impression. No doubt some of you that are listening to this will also have seen it, but it's probably new to many of you, having happened quite some time ago. In the last episode I closed off by saying we'd work our way north from Tangalima, and that hasn't happened because I've just got carried away with little bits and pieces in this episode. But in the next episode, I'm going to try to work my way north of Tangalima. So stand by for that one. Until then, good fishing.